All right, so thank you, Finn. Thank you for being here to you all, and thanks to the Center for Contemporary South Asia and to the Watson Institute for hosting me. It's really an honor and a pleasure to be here this afternoon in this lovely space, no less. So I'm talking about neoliberal spirituality today, what I'm calling neoliberal spirituality. So I want to begin with these magazine covers to illustrate that the yoga industry, which I think is a crucial node of what I'm calling neoliberal spirituality, has gone global and how in various contexts it can look very different. So we've got Indian yoga guru Baba Ramdev here and the American <coughs> model and beauty guru Christy Turlington. Yet in other ways, similar, believe it or not, uh, these are both CEOs of large corporations, and they're both doing a form of what scholars refer to as modern postural yoga. So we've all heard the expression, you are what you eat, and historically the extent of religious concern about when, what, or how a person eats is met only by concerns about with whom or when or how a person has sex. Hence, attention in many religious systems to purifying the body through rigorous control over diet and fasting alongside celibacy. Today, especially among the privileged elite, religion is as much about what a person buys, another kind of consumption. Hence, my work theorizes what I'm calling neoliberal spirituality as a social, economic, political, cultural, and religious project locating its disciplines, discourses, and institutions of self-care within the late capitalist framework. Drawing cases especially from the global yoga industry, I tease out this religious complex's deep elective affinity with the dynamics of neoliberal capitalism and the tendency to wed the goal of material prosperity to the quest for liberation, rooted in some form of ancient or exotic wisdom Personal growth, self-care, and transformation are just some of the generative tropes in this narrative of the, uh, of the, in the narrative of this spiritual identity. In its discourses, we find a meta-narrative that frames things in terms of market value, reflects certain assumptions about human existence, value, and purpose, and works hard to regulate authority. Huge swaths of consumers in global cities all over the world spend their money on spiritual commodities. Hence the emergence of large transnational corporations, indeed entire industries, producing neoliberal spirituality's products. So as Finn mentioned, the analysis I'll get into in a minute builds on my first book, Selling Yoga, From Counterculture to Pop Culture, which pivots around the question of how the study of yoga can help us better understand religion's role in consumer culture. So in Selling Yoga, I combined theoretical, historical, and cultural approaches to explore the yoga boom in contemporary culture, arguing for a double thesis. On the one hand, yoga has always been polythetic in the many pathways of its historical development as a part of South Asian religious history, and has remained so through modern yoga's evolution and popularization. On the other hand, although the yoga industry's devotion to fitness, self-care, and health mirrors consumer culture's emphasis on self-development self through careful consumer choice. For many practitioners, yoga's religious qualities have not been eliminated. They've been transformed. So even though the yoga industry was birthed by consumer culture, it remains deeply religious, even in, and I would say in some ways through, commodification. So my insistence that we study commercial yoga as a body of religious practice serves as a critique of competing studies that bemoan the consumer branding, commodification, and popularization of yoga and other spiritual commodities as the loss of an imagined, purer, authentic religious practices. Approaches that fit yoga within a framework that pits corrupt commodifications of religion against so-called authentic religious complexes. Whereas in selling yoga, I asked how yoga practitioners share many qualities with what we often imagine as traditional religions, including demarcating sacred spaces and time, creating communities built around shared values, posing solutions to the problems of suffering and death, and constructing and sharing myths and rituals. My current work 
asks about their political dimensions, and especially their relationship to the dominant power dynamics of neoliberal capitalism. Of course, the argument that neoliberal capitalism molds cultures of self-care accords with the academic consensus that the, per the present moment's arrangement of social structures and ideologies shapes the ways people are capable of thinking, even when they seek to think beyond or against the dominant order. Whichever area of religion or culture one studies to, uh, under the current global system, be it the so-called spiritual but not religious, or the religiously affiliated, one will likely uncover the assumption that a person is entitled to as great a share of the world's resources as that person's money can buy, and in turn, that the needs of capital largely determine the priorities of the respective disciplines, discourses, and institutions, that they reproduce inequalities, exclude the majority of the population, especially from positions of power, and produce surplus value for a privileged, often white, heteropatriarchal minority. Of course, scholars love arguing over the meaning of words, and it's fair to say that neoliberalism is one of the most contested terms in the contemporary lexicon. Following Wendy Brown, I'm using neoliberalism to refer to not just a set of late capitalist free market economic policies, but also a governing rationality that disseminates market values and metrics to every sphere of life formulating everything everywhere in terms of capital investment and appreciation, including and especially living beings. Neoliberal, neoliberal governmentality can be seen at play in discourses of self-sufficiency, which reify the individual, construed as an automaton, ideally self-optimizing, self-sustaining, and entrepreneurial. And so we can see in the discourses of spirituality printed across, for example, yoga wear, not just examples of cultural appropriation, and Ohm here is a nod to Finn, but also neoliberal discourses. You're exactly where you're supposed to be. What you think you become. These discourses of governmentality that put an enormous amount of weight on individual choice and control over her circumstances. We can address the politics of neoliberal spirituality by attending to a number of things, for example, the power dynamics underlying cultural appropriation, authoritarian abuses, particularly in cases of sexual abuse and harassment, the ways yoga is instrumentalized toward conservative ends, for example, the criminalization of same-sex and transgender sex in India, and the perpetuation of gender inequities, mass incarceration, and non-intervention in the face of climate change. When we speak of the spiritual commodities that consumers describe as empowering, transformative or liberating. We are not talking about things that challenge or weaken dominant hierarchies. Neither do they challenge a conservative mindset. The connections between neoliberal spirituality and many other areas of public and private life are explicit insofar as much of those industries' products are rooted in concerns about deviancy, not only in the form of low productivity, but also forms of social deviancy. The prescriptions for self-care or personal liberation, in other words, have little or nothing to do with societal transformation. Rather, they denote the requirements for more productive, efficient, and conforming workers and consumers. In other words, as the demands on people to work and be productive have increased, so we have seen an increase in yoga teachers, natural dietary systems, and mindfulness courses which for the most part claim to enhance productivity and simultaneously conformity to a rigid moral, not to mention bodily, standard. Put differently, spiritual industries support neoliberal capitalism, both in this pursuit of surplus value and ideological control. That is, by reinforcing its structures, norms, and values, and punishing deviations from them. Neoliberal politics are visible in the discourses and practices of some of the industry's most powerful corporations and proponents, including, including the current Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi, and his spiritual ally and the most famous living yoga guru in India, Baba Ramdev, featured on that first slide. As well as some of the most popular yoga corporations today, such as Spiritual Gangster, from which these 
images are drawn. This is a US-based yoga wear company whose products are, quote, inspired by peace, love, and all things yoga, end quote. As well as Bikram yoga, or the original hot yoga. Creating deviant outgroups from marketing strategies like these that present a narrow vision of the ideal female body, to Modi's political strategies whereby yoga is weaponized against a Muslim mi minority, and claiming that members of such groups fail to choose the right spiritual interventions to cultivate self-improvement serves these ends. A wide range of commodities, yoga mats, smoothies, mindfulness, mala beads, crystals, natural foods, and anything with Zen printed across it, are celebrated as good consumer choices, products that lead to better living outcomes. If you are unhappy, unwell, stressed out, or not the proper weight, that's because you're not making the right consumer choices. You're not buying the right stuff. In addition to the problems of cultural appropriation and Orientalism, there's also the heteropatriarchy of neoliberal spirituality. In fact, gender is central, not peripheral, to its operations especially insofar as heteropatriarchy shapes the ways authority is demarcated and exercised such that structural transformation is not expected as the solution to gender inequities. Rather, resolving those challenges is a burden placed on the shoulders of the disenfranchised, that is, women and other gender and sexual minorities. Spiritual commodities, in other words, are an individual's tool for breaking the glass ceiling not dismantling the ceiling so that all women and other gender and sexual minorities have equal opportunity. So if you're a working mom and you feel exhausted all the time, take a yoga class, study mindfulness. This is the way to achieve that envied work-life balance, not demanding structural changes, such as better parental leave policies or childcare at the workplace. Most significantly, spirituality industries individualize what are fundamentally social and political issues in society. This obviously suits neoliberal capitalism. It follows an ideology that you need to work on yourself rather than look to social resources for solutions to your problems or demand structural changes. Their discourses are highly useful in depoliticizing the oppressive and increasingly <coughs> grim reality of life on this planet. The obstacles capitalism poses are the very challenges of the Anthropocene. The main force behind the Anthropocene, which I'm having trouble saying for some reason, is capitalism's global exponential growth. Capitalists recognize no limit to its expansion. No amount of profit, wealth, or consumption is enough or too much. Governments embedded in the neoliberal capitalist economy rather than design universal social programs with the aim of reducing inequality and establish market regulations in order to serve the common good and protect the environment, usually delegate the task of managing markets to big businesses under the guise of free markets and scale back social programs in order to minimize government spending. As a consequence of capitalism's exponential growth, as I speak, the world suffers from increased global warmth and the natural catastrophes to which it contributes. More specifically, carbon dioxide emissions, ocean acid acid acidification, fossil fuel combustion, mass species extinctions, and other losses in biological diversity, nitrogen and phosphorus cycle disruptions, freshwater depletion, forest loss, and chemical pollution, resulting in a planetary ecological emergency or earth system crisis. There are uh, climate refugees right here in the US, devastating natural events from flooding and hurricanes to tornadoes and forest fires are increasingly becoming the norm. The involvement of spiritual discourses, disciplines, and institutions here is only one factor in the bigger problem then, which is of course the way the neoliberal capitalist project destroys the social, the collective, and the environment. Uh-oh. There we go, we woke it up. Namaste all day. Good karma. Self-love club. Dope soul. Zen AF, that is zen as fuck. And my personal favorite, 
Your ego is not your amigo. <laughs> These are just a few of the catchy expressions found printed across yoga wear. The website from which this was taken for Spiritual Gangster displays beautiful, slim, usually white bodies clad in remarkable combinations of cotton and spandex and forever in a state of leisure at varying locations ranging from an urban basketball court to a bed of white linens in what appears to be a high-end resort, but always with an exotic backdrop. This is the person you should be, lounging in your yoga pants, or in this case, no pants at all. <laughs> you would feel beautiful, positive, relaxed, and spiritual. But in a fleeting moment, you might also slip into a painfully reflexive state as you realize you are also a cog in the economic and social machine of neoliberal capitalism. You might marvel and then retract at the neoliberal projects of magical abilities to cultivate perpetual anxiety about not only your productivity, but also your responsibility for every dimension of life, to make you work more even when doing so brings you less in return, and to create a void, and then to fill it. Spiritual gangster yoga wear is just one articulation of this peculiar variant of spirituality that has come to the forefront of global culture in the past few decades, and incites its adherents to accept full responsibility for their own well-being, self-care, and liberation. Quote, and this is taken from the Spiritual Gangster website, our mission is to inspire positivity, generosity, kindness, and connectedness with this goal in mind. May all beings everywhere be happy and free. We are connected. We are the same. We are one." End quote. So there are a lot of examples of neoliberal spirituality beyond the yoga industry. Um, in response to questions of how to change your attitude when you cannot change your circumstances, Jewish American health coach, mindful weight loss entrepreneur, and self-described foremost expert on Maimonides and ancient health, David Zolberg advises, quote, change your perception, belief, or opinion of the situation, and that will help you change your attitude. Some other tidbits of advice include, Quote, admit to yourself that you're not happy. Realize optimism is a choice. Use positive words. Hang out with friends who have a happy vibe. And say a daily affirmation, end quote. The Hindu yoga guru, Baba Ramdev, I've mentioned, similarly espouses a message of positive thinking and self-care, which he disseminates across India through speeches, interviews and advertisements and other media platforms. This self-care spirituality is precisely the kind that informs best-selling manifestos, such as Whole Foods CEO John Mackey's Conscious Capitalism, in which the ideal person is construed as automatized, self-optimizing, and entrepreneurial. Now, neoliberal spirituality embodies all sorts of contradictions giving rise to social and political controversies, including that which arose around the closure of the Burrard Street Bridge from the, uh, for the 2015 International Day of Yoga. In 2015 in Vancouver, home to yoga apparel giant Lululemon, a scheduled yoga day event threatened to divide the city and the local community due to the province of British Columbia's planned uh, or proposed $150,000 contribution. Corporate sponsors, including Lululemon, and the planned seven-hour Om the Bridge closure. The added irony was that the event was largely sponsored by an affluent white Canadian demographic and threatened to eclipse National Aboriginal Day, all while its organizers claimed to celebrate an ancient system of knowledge indigenous to India, that is, yoga. The event was canceled following a week of protest. Events for Yoga Day have even sparked controversy in India, where Indian Muslims protested Yoga Day events, 
arguing they serve right-wing Prime Minister Narendra Modi's saffron agenda, that is, his Hindu nationalism. Modi is a tight ally of Baba Ramdev, who's also worked to criminalize same-sex sex in India, and has described homosexuality as a disease, and prescribed yoga as the cure. There's a paradox in Ramdev's work. On the one hand, Ramdev's stance seems fundamentally nationalist and conservative. He, and this is an image of, of Ramdev here with um, Modi. Um, he profits off of products marketed as traditional, natural foods and ancient medicinal practices. In, in Ramdev, his corporation, Patanjali Ayurved, has a strong brand ambassador one credited with bringing yoga to the mainstream in India. He has supporters across the country who choose Patanjali Ayurved products because of the yogic authority they invest in its ambassador, as well as the nationalist associations of the brand. Ramdev consistently positions Patanjali Ayurved as a homegrown Indian company fighting global multinational corporations. Ramdev is piggybacking on Modi's Make in India campaign to promote his goods. His company's logo and packaging use, use the orange, white, and green of the Indian flag. And although packaging information is written in English, it says made in Bharat, using the country's Hindi name, rather than made in India. All of Patanjali Ayurved's products are marketed as Swadeshi, meaning of one's own country or indigenous to India. But like other entrepreneurs selling yoga and associated products globally, Ramdev is also building a massive corporation selling packaged, branded, and commercialized products with sleek modern advertising. And he thrives in a modern health and wellness sector that is growing globally, a sector that calls on consumers to take responsibility for their health, wellness, success, and empowerment. His products include skin whitening cream, and he's even announced plans to compete in the athleisure, athleisure apparel industry with Made in Bharat yoga wear. So Ramdev is helping to accelerate yoga's entry into the 21st century neoliberal capitalist global economy. He's playing a modern, urban, right-wing, and neoliberal game. It thrives on nostalgia about lost cultural norms, as well as neoliberal narratives about the value of self-care, personal improvement, and free choice. Entrepreneurial gurus like these might be appealing in part because they successfully appropriate and commodify the ancient ideas and symbols of India, but they also represent one expression of a global shift toward a form of spirituality that uses commodities and consumption to demarcate the morally acceptable. <coughs> so, it might surprise you, but I don't mean to offer just one more voice bemoaning the commodification of spirituality as a numbing device through which consumer, consumers ignore the problems of neoliberal capitalism or as the corruption or loss of authentic religious forms. Many scholars have already offered referenda on spiritual commodities, suggesting they merely serve as palliatives or coping mechanisms. Here are just a couple examples of some, um, some popular books on spirituality that make this, this kind of case. These commodities, in their view, function like a fetish that helps consumers feel as if they have escaped reality. In other words, they offer consumers an escape into an experience of the present moment, of a romanticized or orientalized other, or an idealized ancient past, which allows them to imagine themselves as separate from the busyness of everyday life and by extension disconnected from the social and economic relations of global capitalism. I agree that the solutions to consumers' problems that spiritual commodities usually offer do not elide the structural and economic undergirding of the Earth's population's greatest threats. For example, environmental degradation. By ignoring that socioeconomic and cultural structures shape our lives, they ensure greater conformity to the reigning ideology and system largely responsible for conditions of exploitation in a dehumanizing workplace, assaults against democracy, and vast social inequalities. These critical contributions to the study of spirituality examine the material and social operations of spiritual commodities, pursued with a sensitivity to subtle, and sometimes not so subtle, power dynamics, 
complicating any straightforward progress narrative about religious democratization, increased choice, or individual autonomy among spiritual consumers. Pointing out that this form of spirituality ultimately directs its address to the middle and upper classes, effectively erasing the problems faced by the vast majority of the population. Furthermore, as much as individual consumers are not in control of their physical living conditions or places on the socioeconomic hierarchy, spiritual shopping gives consumers a sense of control over their lives. Adherents of this type of spirituality use the notion of consumer choice to convince themselves they are in control of their well-being, self-care, happiness, and empowerment. So all of this has been said, and while acknowledging these insights of these other studies on spirituality, in three ways I invite us to consider a more nuanced analysis. First, and I think probably most importantly, to me at least, I ask that we consider, or I ask what we should make of the subversive discourses of spirituality that do call on adherents to think beyond the individual and even out into the environment. Spiritual gangster products, for example, range from yoga pants with good vibes applicate across the butt to t-shirts that read peace, love, yoga, as if these were three inherently compatible and mutually reinforcing commitments. The appropriation of gangster itself could be read as subversive, since gang culture is historically a space of black resistance. And according to the Spiritual Gangster website, quote, we exercise love as the most powerful form of activism, end quote. The company also donates an unspecified percentage of every sale to provide food for those living in poverty. <coughs> so what about these entrepreneurs and corporations profiting off spiritual commodities that claim to counter the problems of unbridled capitalism with charitable giving or various forms of conscious capitalism? What should we make of the Indian state's efforts to challenge the imperialism behind Western commodifications of yoga, more specifically, the North American multi-billion dollar yoga industry, by reclaiming yoga for India? Or Baba Ramdev's company, Patan Patanjali Ayurved, which claims to offer alternatives to the products of Western corporations in their natural Ayurvedic products? What should we make of the feminist spiritual discourses, the calls for women's empowerment that are nearly ubiquitous in spiritual discourses, all while placing the burden of success on individual women and their willingness to work hard, think positively, and aspire for equality? Some spiritual consumers, we all know, might greenwash the products uh, they buy, from yoga apparel to tableware. Everywhere in the developed world, plastic has taken over our households, accessories, and even our clothes. And there's growing concern over the images broadcast across mainstream media of plastic waste crowding oceans and beaches. Spiritual consumers might respond by opting for the high-end apparel of Sattva Living, which offers, quote, mindfully designed organic fashion, end quote. The company claims to improve the health and wellness of conscious consumers, as well as the lives of Indian organic farmers, by partnering with Sumintir India Organics and working under the model of creative capitalism, an approach that ensures that a portion of profits are invested back into the communities and agricultural programs of the farmers. Sattva Living products are sold across India, as well as the United States, and are available, for example, at Whole Foods Market where spiritual consumers might also shop for eco-friendly, biodegradable paper plates. The multimillionaire entrepreneur I've already mentioned, John Mackey, uses this phrase, conscious capitalism, arguing that capitalism's heroic spirit, uh, quote, heroic spirit, is the key to creating a world in which all people live lives full of prosperity, love, and creativity a world of compassion and freedom, end quote. So I, attend, I suggest that we attend to these subversive elements of neoliberal spirituality, suggesting that rather than a mode through which consumers ignore, escape, or are numbed to the problems of neoliberal capitalism, 
Many spiritual commodities, corporations, and entrepreneurs do actually acknowledge those problems. And in fact, they subvert them. But they subvert them through mere gestures. From provocative taglines printed across t-shirts or packaging to various forms of charitable giving, commodification serves as a strategy through which subversion itself is colonized. In other words, neoliberal spirituality represents a religious complex through which protest against the reigning socioeconomic and cultural order is simultaneously expressed and contained. So drawing on Mark Fisher's work on capitalist realism, the dominant idea that there's no viable alternatives to capitalism, I suggest choosing spiritual commodities that represent revolutionary, egalitarian, environmentally friendly, or authentically ancient values can best be understood as a form of gestural anti-capitalism or gestural subversion. Fisher describes this kind of anti-capitalist counter discourse, which is widely disseminated in pop culture. He discusses, for example, Hollywood movies or television. How often is the villain the evil corporation? This is a product, uh, according to Fisher, of capitalist realism. As Fisher points out, Hollywood films that villainize capitalism exemplify what Robert Fuller calls interpassivity. The film performs our anti-capitalism for us, allowing us to continue to consume without blame or guilt. So in other words, we have these anti-capitalist inclinations because of the violence we're witnessing. And so we perform our anti-capitalism by paying to see a movie or buying certain consumer products. And then that's our act uh, in, in opposition to capitalism, um, is by buying stuff by buying anti-capitalist stuff. In other words, in my view, spirituality with its countercultural or subversive gestures is domesticated to the dominant culture, to a neoliberal capitalist rationality. Another way to put this is that consumption of spiritual commodities entails a misrecognition, whereby the consumer confronts certain problems of capitalism by consuming, that is, by buying the products of a sustainable brand name in a way akin to how a white consumer here in Providence, per se, paying for a yoga class with a teacher who's traveled and studied in India might assume that class is closer to authentic yoga than one offered by a teacher who's only studied domestically. In both cases, the consumer choices themselves confront some of the greatest problems of consumer culture, say, environmental degradation or cultural imperialism, but without impunity for those very problems. Contrast this kind of self-care with that of activists who refuse to cooperate with dominant power structures, offering instead socialist perspectives that emphasize a type of agency exercised through critiques and diagnoses of unequal power, uh, social structures, solidarity building, educational campaigns, and ultimately revolution. In 1988, Black lesbian writer and activist Audre Lorde of political, uh, famously said, quote, caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare, end quote. The call was to use self-care as a means to remaining ever alert to the threat of social inequality and the responsibility of radicals to sustain political commitment and to manifest social solidarity which require that they insist that they, whether black, brown, female, queer, whatever, are worthy of self-care. Since then, several prominent black women activists have echoed this call, drawing connections between race, activism, and self-care. Angela Davis, for example, has suggested self-care must be incorporated in all radical political efforts if there's any hope for victories. LGBTQ people from across the world echoed this call following the 2016 mass shooting at a gay nightclub in Orlando, Florida, when people started posting selfies under the hashtag queer self love. Most recently, the, mo the, more, uh, the most notable climate activist today, Greta Thunberg, has demanded action in the form of concrete policy changes to prevent catastrophic climate change. 
She addresses world leaders attending UN climate summits around the world, for example, as well as the general population. The 16-year-old climate activist is a leading figure in the climate justice movement, inspiring millions across the globe since she launched her school strike in 2018. Thunberg is also on the autism spectrum and has faced insults and criticisms in light of that. She's responded, quote, when haters go after your looks and differences, it means they have nowhere left to go. And then you know you're winning, end quote. And she posted this on Twitter using the hashtag uh, Aspie, Aspie Power. Sorry, hashtag Aspie Power. While acknowledging, while acknowledging that being on the uh, autism spectrum poses challenges, she also has described it as a superpower. So those are just some um, alternative models of self-care, self-love um, that I wanted to put out there as models of um, self-care that is wedded to political activism, as opposed to the kind that we find in neoliberal spirituality that I'm critiquing. Oh, we went to sleep again. There we go. Okay, so the second way that I hope to, uh, to nuance the critique of, of spirituality is I think we should use neoliberal spirituality as a way to intervene in the narrative on religion and globalization. Studies on the commodification of spirituality are largely focused on North America and Western Europe, failing to account for the reality that we now live in a globalized world in which people, movements, and commodities are not isolated by geographic boundaries. Furthermore, much of the scholarship on religion and globalization focuses on religious violence, especially in Islam, and global Christianity. Less so do we hear about spiritual ideas, practices, or commodities coming out of India or other parts of Asia, for example. Um, for example. Yet movements like global yoga offer a powerful alternative to the usual narratives of globalization. Globalization is by no means simply a Western phenomenon and by no means simply a matter of the East responding reactively to ideas and goods flowing from the West or Eastern ideas and practices becoming Westernized, resulting in, quote, American yoga, or Mick mindfulness. I don't think these kinds of categories are useful. Rather, than, rather globalization is a far more decentralized, multifocal, and multidirectional process, emerging from countless points across a shifting interconnected network. And third, Although many have theorized global spirituality as deeply neoliberal, they have also seen its rise from yoga to mindfulness as an isolated and unrepresentative episode within the broader historical arc of neoliberalism, rather than a phenomenon closely linked to the 21st century successes of heteropatriarchy and other forms of conservatism. In other words, they have not, these have not been understood as a part of a single overarching phenomenon. I think we can provide a fuller account of the neoliberal era that renders successes of right-wing movements, Brexit, Trump, Modi, and the rise of neoliberal spirituality as integral and related features of the global system. Spiritual consumers largely refrain from seeing and critiquing themselves from a distance, either historical or from the vantage of another race, gender, or class. And their consumer choices often signal a profound, sometimes violent, draw toward purity. In all of these ways, neoliberal spirituality reifies racial and class privilege as well as heteronormativity, lending itself not only to neoliberal, but in some cases, conservative agendas. So when it comes to sexual violence, for example, uh, as I've already mentioned, Baba Ramdev was instrumental in recriminalizing same-sex sex in India, which exacerbated the social and physical vulnerability of LGBTQ Indians. On the other hand, since the October 2017 New York Times publication of investigative work into the decades of sexual harassment allegations against Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein, hundreds of women from the yoga industry have stepped forward to say, me too. Most notably, in December 2017, Rachel Brathen collected hundreds of stories 
of uh, Me Too stories and posted them on her Yoga Girl website. These were drawn specifically from the yoga industry. The hundreds of Me Too expo exposés chronicled mostly women's stories in which they, were, they accused mostly male yoga teachers or gurus. Most notably, the famous yoga guru responsible for inventing Ashtanga yoga, Patabi Joyce, of exploitative and sexually violent conduct. And so, for those of you who might not know as much about the yoga industry, Joyce is responsible for the creation of Ashtanga yoga, uh, but also the, it's, it's, it's from Ashtanga yoga that we get flow of yoga, which is taught in yoga studios all over the world now. And it's the, is, is a definitely the most popular form of yoga um, today. And, he, and, and pictured here, I don't talk about it in this paper, but pictured here is Bikram, um, Bikram Chowdhury of Bikram Yoga, who's also been accused of sexually violent behavior, sexual harassment, and even rape. The ways contemporary yoga gurus and teachers are perpetrators of or are complicit in sexual violence reflect the troubling gender and sexual politics long embedded in neoliberal spirituality. Attempts to diagnose the problem range from blaming the guru model, pointing to the flawed attribution of infallibility and insistence on submission to gurus, to blaming the conservative, sexist, and heterosexist ideals certain individual teachers or gurus represent. I think these are accurate in capturing the authoritarian dysfunctions of particular guru-disciple relationships. However, none of them sufficiently explains the unique strategies through which power is abused and how so many industry leaders get away with violence against women and sexual minorities, especially when, in the popular imagination, spiritual practices such as yoga are associated with health and wellness, women's empowerment, and self-care. The symbolic opposition of yoga to sexism and heterosexism operates within a theoretical framework that posits progressive spirituality as an alternative to conservative religion. But this binary is just not a lived reality. Alternative genealogies around sexual violence can be narrated through attention not only to individual incidents of sexual harassment and assault, but also by reading the texts of popular publications, such as Yoga Journal, or listening to widely disseminated yoga discourses, such as uh, those of Ramdev. Yoga Journal, for those, again, who aren't really familiar with the yoga industry, is the most widely marketed yoga magazine. And it's a North American-based publication. In these, we learn that single women, queer people, fat people, sick people, people of color, differently abled and atypical people, and poor people are real problems. We learn that yoga practitioners, should they want to survive and thrive, must avoid, call out, and regulate these problems of deviancy. Industry leaders learn that its prescriptions about how to govern bodies and sexuality has a productive energy that can be harnessed to convince consumers to buy more commodities and therefore support the industry, even when that support also cultivates discrimination, exclusion, and abuse. For example, many spirituality industries call on women not to subvert heteropatriarchal social structures that obstruct their abilities to parent while fulfilling the demands of a career, but to use yoga as a means of achieving that envied uh, what I already mentioned, the envied work-life balance, which I think is impossible, by the way. <laughs> Corporations and industries run only by convincing consumers that they are imperfect, flawed, and that they can be healed if only they purchase the right products. So in short, I suggest we use neoliberal capitalism as a framework for understanding sexual violence and the generally conservative ethos of spirituality, including the yoga industry. So I'm going to wrap up. In the academic study of religion and pop culture and in popular spiritual publications themselves, there's often a desire for a narrative of unity, as if there's an essence or core to popular spirituality and to the cultures it appropriates from. But the discomfort that comes with efforts to illuminate the differences and discrepancies, even in especially political ones, is necessary. Ultimately, 
attending to discrepancies and contradictions, especially contradictions. Acknowledge, acknowledging all of these industries' moving parts will strengthen the collective project to understand not only neoliberal spirituality, but religion in contemporary society. Neoliberal discor uh, spiritual discourses, disciplines, and institutions, including its countless commodities, for example, a t-shirt with peace, love, yoga, applique across the front, often enact an Orientalist fantasy of enlightenment ethics that's especially seductive in a world of ever-expanding obligations and needs. A desire to subvert the violence of neoliberal capitalism is expressed and then contained. In and through its creative usage of neoliberal governance, its capitalist orientalist tropes, and uses of neoliberal feminist discourses around empowerment and freedom, the text of spirituality provides a theoretical model and ideological justification for a neoliberal ethic. For all of the peace and love it offers through yoga, health foods, mindfulness, and countless other modes of self-governance, neoliberal spirituality plays a divisive and conservative game that thrives on nostalgia about lost cultural norms, demarcating outsiders, as well as narratives about transformation and liberation and the value of self-care. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andrea. Um, so now, as we usually do, we'll just uh, give, give over the next kind of 45 minutes or an hour, uh, depending on the energy, to, to discussion of this. So maybe I'll just start, and we can open it up to the, to the group. Um, so yeah, this, this is a great talk, really compelling, and in, in many ways, like just um, such a devastating critique, right, of not only yoga but the, its place in perpetuating, um, you know, the kind of inequities of the world we live in, right? So if we accept, I think you mentioned um, this kind of, uh, uh, capitalist realism, right? This this premise that whatever stories we may tell ourselves, we're kind of ineluctably stuck in this kind of capitalist neoliberal order. And so that, I guess that begs the question for me of, um, uh, around activism, you mentioned some of the alternative modes of self-care that might be able to counter that, but, but maybe to, to kind of broaden that a little bit and make it more existential, is it really possible to, if you're, if you're within, working within the system that we're all doomed to be part of, is it possible to transcend or dismantle it, right, in any, in any meaningful way? And then, and what, um, and then bringing it back narrowly to, to yoga, what can yoga do toward that end, right? And then make it even much more personal, and maybe in a way that um, other people in the room might be thinking: Can one, go, in light of this critique, can one go to a yoga class, <laughs> right? Without, do, do you know what I'm saying? I, I, I mean, it's yeah. partly a, like a ha ha funny question, but it's also, yeah. it's also like kind of, I think in a way, it gets at the what's so devastating about this critique, right? Like really trying to um, politically take responsibility for that kind of mundane yeah. um, gestural subversion, as you, said, as you said. So is there a yoga that is um, subversive yeah. in, a, in, a, in a meaningful way? So this is, this is the question I get everywhere I go. Sure. Is, so what's the answer? Because right. obviously my project is very deconstructive. Mm -hmm. um, but, I, I'm not prescriptive. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. I, I don't. I I uh, I'm, I don't buy into capitalist realism. The idea that there aren't viable alternatives. Mm -hmm. I think social a socialist revolution is worth pursuing. It's a socialist project. Um, yet I don't prescribe how we ought to go about it. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is, I think, s some value um, in just being a cultural diagnostician, right? Uh, and I right. see that as my project. That itself. Um, you know, I would hope would kind of serve to fuel some kind of prescriptive vision yeah. um, and activism, but that's, that's not my role, so I don't have answers. That, but that said, I would say, I will add that we're all complicit, mm -hmm. right? We are all complicit because we're all consumers. And so we are in the system. This is the water we're swimming in. And so whether or not you do yoga or shop at Whole Foods, you're complicit because you're, you're doing something else that's a product of neoliberal capitalism and is upholding its power structures, I mean, mm -hmm. by being in higher education. 
Uh, we've seen the neoliberalization of higher education as much as we've seen the neoliberalization of spirituality. Um, and so we're in it, and um, I wouldn't say, I, I don't want to, um, I don't want to target spirituality as somehow uniquely complicit, mm -hmm. because uh, they're not. Instead, I think it's just a really helpful, it's a, it's a helpful way to think about um, neoliberalism and religion under neoliber uh, neoliberalism. But it doesn't have to be yoga, it doesn't have to be spirituality. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could do this through, through a number of cases, uh, a mm -hmm. number of ways. Um, so, yeah. Well, let me follow up on that, because I mean, first of all, yeah, that, that's fair enough. Like, describing something in itself is a real contribution, right? I and mean, no one can ask you to somehow save the world or give a prescription at all. But if, um, if we're kind of honing in on yoga, and this is more germane to your project and what motivates you, um, can you say more about why yoga? Like, if, if it doesn't have to be yoga, that is the kind of conduit or vehicle for this critique, why did yoga compel you to? to develop this critique yeah. through a, a first so, and a second book. You know? Okay, for two reasons. Number one, because I find that the critiques of spirituality have been really inadequate. Mm -hmm. I, I just never found it compelling that, and I think this is ra like extremely an anti-socialist position, that consumers are so dumb that they have no agency and that they just are brainwashed into buying these products. Um, I think they absolutely make choices based on uh, their sense of agency and their discomfort with the fact that the world is coming to an end and they, they're witnesses to it, right? You can turn on the TV and see whales being cut open and just ridiculous amounts of plastic coming out of their guts. We see this and it makes us uncomfortable and we want to do something about it. Right, and we, we we so we we have agency as consumers. We are empowered, and so we buy the biodegradable paper plates instead of the plastic ones. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that's a dumb move. I think it's not an effective move. Move, and so that was part of what compelled me to, to focus on spirituality. Is that I found find these studies that sort of like paint spiritual consumers as somehow dumber than consumers at, at large, um, and then also. Um, I, uh, I think that, what was I going to say? Let's see. Um, oh, I, I suppose that, that yoga consumers themselves oftentimes think of themselves as activists or um, spiritual consumers. And so we saw like in the discourses around spiritual gangster, like this is a form of activism. And they will use this language and they'll talk about freedom and liberation and empowerment in particular. And especially you hear this in the, um, neoliberal feminist discourses and spirituality. And so I was seeking to sort of counter this, this, this idea that like spirituality is somehow progressive mm -hmm. and empowering mm -hmm. as opposed to traditional religions. Um, and so for these two reasons, I was just drawn especially to, to looking at spirituality and yoga. Uh, but again, you see neoliberal, spirit, uh, sorry, neoliberal feminist discourses in lots of other industries, not just the yoga one. Questions? Yes, sir. Um, thanks. Uh, I love that, like in a talk that you can that, that brings together Bob on them, Audre Lord, Whale Guts. Like, I mean, like I'm, I'm totally into the community. I mean, like it's, it's and I'm really, but I, mean, I actually mean that. But I also mean that, like in a kind of scholarly sense, like to actually productively bring um, the Hindu right and kind of neoliberal capitalism together is is fantastic. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Because um, they're often kind of. Things that, especially, I mean, from I'm not a religious studies scholar, but I'm an anthropologist of capitalism, right? There are things that kind of there, there's there's a capitalist kind of space between mm -hmm. the two conversations mm -hmm. that um, I think is really cool that you're bringing that together. Thank you. Um, so, uh, so kind of you know, since you're kind of like that, I love that you kind of you know talk about it as cultural uh, diagnostic, uh, cultural diagnostician. So, of a, as a cultural diagnostician of this, you know, yoga industrial complex. Um, I kind of wanted to maybe, I mean, just hear you maybe talk a little bit more about the empirics of the project, maybe even um, kind of historicize um, some things, uh, maybe a little bit more, um, and particularly right uh, on this kind of project of yoga as a program of like making normative, making normative bodies, making yeah. normative consumers, making 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 normativity in these kind of diverse forms. Um, so I, like, I was wondering if that project kind of uh, was attended to that production, right? That production of the guru that makes that then like in this kind of uh, in this neoliberal complex, like that does that work of making normative, right? So yoga teacher kind of trainings, 
Um, you know, I mean, I understand the spiritual, spiritual nature, you know, kind of stuff, but like, what about like the kind of commodification of experience and the kind of commodification of of bodies in that kind of in that kind of other sense, right? That such that this project is made more fractal and made, yeah. made and, and allowed to kind of persist and and replicate itself in this kind of you know neoliberal cancerous capitalist kind of way. Um, so I mean, so I mean, maybe just are you talking about you know teacher trainings? Um, are you what are the what are the kind of empirical kind of threads of the of the critique? <laughs> yeah. Well, first let me just um, comment on the historical question. Yeah. So, like in the Sailing Yoga book, I make the case that yoga was really um, it didn't it. We oftentimes imagine it as following this sort of linear trajectory of increasing popularization, mm -hmm. but in fact, yoga uh, it didn't have this linear trajectory. Instead, it was countercultural up until the '80s. And, and, that, and, and I'm talking about modern postural yoga, even in India, modern postural yoga was not popular by any means, right? Um, and so, uh, so in terms of the historical roots, and especially the, uh, this idea around like creating normative bodies, uh, yoga was not a way of, uh, of like engaging in any form of like normative embodiment. In fact, it was just the opposite. It was seen as radically uh, uh, countercultural, um, and 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 there were you know many figures in the modern in modern yoga's history like Vivekananda, who strongly condemned postural yoga because of its embodied because it was an embodied practice, and so he saw it as dangerous. Um, and then in India. It, Modern postural yoga uh, was really countercultural, but in a sort of anti-imperialist way. Mm -hmm. It was a mode through which not you didn't strengthen women's bodies; you strengthened strengthen men's body, moth bodies, in opposition to uh, Western imperialism. Um, so it was, a, it was a it was a mode through which men were masculinized. Um, so anyway, there, there's a really there's some really interesting historical background there, and it's also interesting to see that it's really not until the the 80s that yoga starts to become popular as a way of achieving a sort of ideal beauty standard. Um, and so, and then related to your second question about like where, I think you're, I think you're asking where I'm like, where I'm going to study body norms, like where I'm, what I'm looking at, like the. the I'm like so fascinated, yeah, like, so like what, like what, yeah, what are yeah, the Yeah, so I, I pay attention, I, I pay a lot of attention to the actual discourses okay. of packaging and yoga wear okay. in this okay. particular project. I'm really fascinated by this cultural obsession with these, the spiritual uh -huh. script that we wear on our bodies. And this is, you don't have, you don't have to buy, the, the spiritual gangster is very high end. It's sold at like mm -hmm. Saks Fifth Avenue, right? But you can go into Target and buy a Peace Love Yoga T-shirt. Um, you can you can get it at, at you know at various levels of, of cost, and um, we see it everywhere. And so that's what I, I mostly focus on. I also focus on uh, marketing campaigns for companies like Lululemon mm -hmm. and Spiritual Gangster and Whole Foods and um, Yoga Journal. And then also uh, I, I also draw on the um, literature that is used by certain yoga corporations to attract uh, potential yoga teachers for teacher training. Mm -hmm. um, and so Bikram Yoga is known, he, he, uh, he now is, has run away to Mexico because, uh, because of these accusations of uh, sexual harassment and abuse, but he still is hosting you know, hundreds of people a year training to be yoga teachers. So I look at the literature that tries to convince people to like train with us as opposed with them. Like this is authentic yoga. Or that bring yoga teachers to India for their training because that somehow makes them more authentic. Or um, yoga teacher trainings now in Africa. I'm also, so one of the things that started me on this project was I was interested in prison yoga. And so I write in the book about prison yoga as also this neoliberal project where, oh my gosh, you know, you're in prison, it's so dehumanizing, so you're, you've been traumatized by the prison system, and so take responsibility for recovering from your own trauma by doing yoga. And um, we see this not just in the United States, but in India and also Africa through the Africa Yoga Project. And the Africa Yoga Project is training hundreds of yoga teachers in Africa, especially Kenya, um, with what I'm seeing as this neoliberal <coughs> lens. So let's just give you some uh, examples.
I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thanks. <laughs> Someone else had a question behind Sarah, yeah. Yeah, um, so you talked about uh, how the parents ways of race or class and gender, and I was wondering if you've done any work with kind of a generational critique of, I hear anecdotally millennials buy experiences. Oh. I don't engage with these generational arguments. I don't find them compelling. I, I really can't stand it when people say that millennials are so superficial or millennials aren't deep thinkers or millennials aren't activists. I just don't find it compelling. But um, also, yoga practitioners are largely not millennials. Um, they're <coughs> largely the generation right now, at least if we're talking about the United States demographics. Um, they're like 40 and 50 year olds doing yoga There's uh, as much as they are 20 and 30 year olds doing yoga. So, um, so no, I haven't engaged with that particular critique. And what was your second question? Oh, there was, it was, oh, okay. it was all the same. Okay, Thanks. yeah. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> I thought that was really powerful and really useful to know that information and to have that critical perspective. And um, it reminds me when I was in grad school and we learned that you know, can't have one foot in and one foot outside of but the older I get, um, I, I mean, and I'll just go, I know this is not popular, you know, in the academy, but <clears throat> the older I get, I just feel like, like I've been asking people, do you think that spirituality is totally constructive, or I'm from a theory background, or performance, or is there something essential to it? And I know that essence is like a totally nasty word, and, and I shouldn't even probably say it, but <clears throat> that's an exaggeration. But, um, you know, in my heart, I mean, I grew up doing gender studies and writing about, you know, feminist playwright, and, uh, but, it, but I talked to people, I asked this question, they said, oh, that reminds me of my mindfulness. And I think, no, there's got to be more than that. Like, what about love? What about sacrificial love? Love for your children? I mean, and where is, the, do, do we have a responsibility to talk about spirituality in addition to and in contradiction to this sort of constructed, mm -hmm. deconstructed version? And I was wondering if you're well, I, I actually am really interested in, in bodies and embodiment. And so, and I think it, that for me, thinking about embodiment does bring up a lot of issues around uh, universalisms, right? Like we give birth in, you know, in similar ways across cultures. And we, um, we, we are, we have, there is, uh, I'm interested in like affect and emotion as embodied um, rather than as purely cultural and constructed. Um, so I think you're right. I think also there are, lang you know, there's ways of talking about religious experience, transformation, spiritual experience that speaks across one's own cultural context. Uh, but that said, uh, you know, I think we have more of a responsibility to address the fact that the world is likely coming to an end unless we do something right now to change it, right? I mean, the suffering is just, it's, we can't even, it's, it, it, we can't even put it into words. Uh, and so I'm pretty apocalyptic. Like I, I'm pretty convinced that we're probably not gonna survive. The, the, you know, we're destroying the environment and there's very little hope that anything's gonna save us. And it's gonna, we're gonna go down and it's gonna be ugly. It's gonna be you know, way worse than it is today. Um, the, 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 the suffering. So in terms of like, do we have a responsibility? I think uh, it, it's not that there aren't ways of talking about embodied experience across cultures, but um, we don't have time. <laughs> we don't have time. We've got to talk about like the social structures that are destroying the earth. So. Yeah, please. Yeah, I very much appreciate the talk. And I think I was coming mainly because I teach martial arts sociology, and so I was interested in the comparisons there. But I'm also teaching recently about David, using David Hardy's book, 17 Contradictions yeah. of Capitalism. Yeah. And so I find the connection more there. But putting those two things together actually leads me to a question that I would find really productive. Um, and that is, uh, if we were to buy Hardy, and the idea that capitalism is coming to an end, that Stalin's 
sustainable. But it's principally not sustainable because of the basic contradiction between use value and exchange value. And what this is so illuminating for me, at least, is the way in which yoga has become so dominated by exchange value. But one of the things that makes it un, you know, unclear for me is whether it matters in your analytical framework to find those instances in which yoga resists its own commodification. Whether it matters where we could accumulate experiences of yoga that are resisting their you know, thing-like quality, mm -hmm. and rather moving toward the spirituality or whatever resists capitalism. And I'll put this uh, to suggestion, and that is that one of the things in the late 70s and early 80s that was so empowering among martial arts was the idea that you are training in martial arts in order to prepare for the socialist revolution. Yeah, yeah. Everybody was kung fu fighting, it was just a song. <laughs> you know, it was about Afro-Asian unity, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So, my question for Hope is where in the yoga world are these resistances, not only to the commodification of yoga practices, but also to the generation of anti-systemic practices mm -hmm. that at least create boundaries between what yeah. is fictitious and what might be. I think that that it could be a really great book project. <laughs> I do. And in fact, that is, that's where I started I, with this project. First, I was interested in prison yoga. And then I thought, I got disillusioned, and I thought, no, prison yoga is just another form of neoliberal yoga. And in fact, it's really dark and terrible. I mean, because the prison industrial complex is so deeply oppressive. And, um, and so then I thought, OK, so I'm going to seek out some of these like pocket yoga communities who are resisting um, uh, neoliberal capitalism in various ways. And I did find yoga communities that attempt to do this. There are, like. Uh, uh, co-op yoga communities where people don't charge for yoga classes, where they take turns teaching, and they don't require students to have any special accessories. Um, and they use the space to politically organize. Uh, but that didn't become my project. My project just increasingly became attention to what is the most popular form of spirituality. I mean, it's not that these pockets of resistance don't exist, but if we're going to theorize yoga in the contemporary world, then, you know, it's mostly this stuff. Um, and so that just, that's where my attention went, and that's where this project went. But I think absolutely there could be a project that identified and studied and analyzed sp spiritual communities that are engaged in political resistance. They exist. They're there. But they're just little pockets. Mm -hmm. you know? And if there's any hope for a socialist revolution, they're going to have to play a part. I mean, they're going to, you know, that's our only hope. Um, not, the, not the yoga people per se, but these pockets of resistance. Kung Fu is probably more powerful. <laughs> 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 Very good. Please, yeah. Um, I just, quick comment. Um, I've, spent, I've just spent 17 years working in the prison system in Rhode Island, and I saw yoga being used. Uh, I didn't actually go, I, didn't, I wasn't actually in the classes, but I knew people who were teaching the classes. And what I heard was that it really helped people a lot with um, healing, yeah. self healing. Yeah. So you know, I just I just see real positive benefits mm -hmm. of yoga among certain populations. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I find it hard to kind of kind of dismiss it. Also. Yeah. So so this is absolutely true. There is no doubt. Mindfulness and yoga heal people. It they do. My, that's not, I mean, I would never, if somebody came to me and said, oh my God, my, you know, I've got this back injury and somebody suggested I do yoga, I wouldn't say, don't do it, right? Sure, I mean, we, you know, we have aches and pains and trauma and we, we want to heal, we all want healing and yoga and mindfulness absolutely can be effective. Nevertheless, my argument is that this sort of focus on individual healing is not constructive for any sort of um, political agenda that seeks to dismantle the structures that cause the trauma to begin with. And that's my critique is that, that yeah, you're traumatized by these op op oppressive social structures um, and you've been imprisoned and tortured 
and yoga can help you survive that. Um, yet it doesn't help to dismantle the cause of the suffering, right? And that's you know wh where our focus should be is on preventing the suffering to begin with, right? Dismantling the prison industrial complex, okay, you do it both which which puts the burden. Um, not on the shoulders of the oppressed, but on those who are empowered and privileged, right? We, you know, we can't expect that the, those who are the, 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 the most oppressed need to shoulder the burden of their own oppression. Um, you use the phrase yoga and mindfulness kind of along often with health foods. <laughs> uh -huh, <laughs> yeah. a, uh, a couple times throughout the talks in the comment, I was just wondering if you've seen any differences between those two modern movements, yoga and mindfulness. Yoga and mindfulness. Yeah. Um, well, there's a gender difference for sure. Uh, and I think that has to do with, uh, with beauty standards and yoga being used specifically because yoga creates um, certain body types um, that have generally, especially in North America and Western Europe, been seen as feminine ideals with sort of like trim muscle as opposed to like big bulky muscles. And so yoga was marketed and sold to women um, as the, a sort of women's fitness practice, right? That wouldn't make you look too big and bulky and, and masculine. Um, mindfulness, on the other hand, was wedded to science and biomedicine. Uh, which has historically been male dominated. And so doctors kind of have taken up mindfulness, um, like Kabat Zen being the most famous example of this, who weds the sort of modern biomedical model of uh, mental health to, to mindfulness. Um, and so, yeah, so I think that, that beyond that, though, I, I see the discourses as very similar. Um, I, w I just don't, I don't see the ne neoliberal feminist discourses as much in, in uh, mindfulness. And I don't, and again, you know, but that's, I, I really see them as like very closely interrelated. Would you, are you thinking of anything particular? I'm curious. Uh, no, I mean, I, I have to think about it. It's more obviously, I think a lot of the things that you talked about today um, definitely do apply uh, to mindfulness as well. I think the most compelling thing you um, said to that end was about a sort of marketing of a particular type of experience, of which one type would be the kind of present moment mm -hmm, experience, mm -hmm. and, and then the consequences of that in terms of when you're marketing that experience, what are you uh, turning away from as you turn sort of towards that, so to speak. So I, I think a lot of it very much applies. I was just curious, given that you did sort of tend to put them together in the same breath, and yeah. I got the sense that you largely thought that they were similar and parallel and working within this broader neoliberal spirituality. I just wondered if there were any ways in which maybe there would be something productive or illuminating by thinking about how they actually, how they differ from each other. Yeah, and that's a good point. I, uh, most of my case studies are drawn from the yoga industry, yeah. but I do uh, attend some to mindfulness mm -hmm. and... I mean, obviously some of these critiques have been coming out recently too with Ron Purser's Work, yes, instance, although he, he provides this sort of, uh, the, the, the approach I'm trying to critique here, because yeah. he says, you know, basically consumers are duped into thinking. It's, pretty well yeah. I, it's, a, it's, it's just so simplistic to me, and, 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 and again, anti-socialist. I think it's really unhelpful for any sort of socialist agenda to paint consumers that way. But he also has, he, I, I, re, I referred to Mick Mindfulness, and his is the book recently out that's called Mick Mindfulness. Spirituality was not just about self healing self up, it was about making changes, the social revolution. And I always found it kind of strange since this whole popularization popularization of yoga that it's it's about self. And, and I hear people talking about spirituality in the culture, and it's all about you know, self healing. That's leaving out of the other, you know, there's spirit, the true spiritual spirituality is relationship, isn't it? And, and so is there any yoga movements or any of these popular yoga movements that really focus on that and really genuinely do it? Or is that just part of the old, you know, religion? The, oh. the essence of, I mean, love and caring. What, we, what you, you suggest is 
what we do in the revolution is an act of love. It's yeah. actually spirituality, I think, what you're doing. Yeah, um, well, I think that, I mean, the, 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 I think at, the yoga industry in general uses these discourses, but it's very much, it's not, I won't say it's not genuine, because I think it is genuine, but it's not in a sort of like, or, like uh, a sense, the sense used in the counterculture as a way to organize, right? Let's organize around our shared commitment to love, and that is tied to a certain model of, of society that is more fair, <laughs> right? And th so that's not the same way that love is invoked in um, popular yoga discourses, where it's invoked all the time everywhere. Um, but it's, it's uh, about self-love. Um, and then it's, but it's also about community making because communities do, are created around self-love. Uh, and so one of the, the things I argue in selling yoga is that, that, that yoga is oftentimes written off as, as like highly um, uh, individualistic and uh, hedonistic. It's like all about like consumption in this hedonist sense, like just buying stuff for your own self-glorification or pleasure. And um, I don't think that's the case at all because yoga consumers are definitely bound to communities. They, be, they, 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 they become committed to certain studios, to a certain brand of yoga. Um, in these communities, they eat together, they, uh, they, they're friends, they spend time in the yoga class and outside the yoga class together. So there is a sort of community making that happens, but the community making is, is not around political uh, commitments or an agenda. Generally. Yeah. I just wonder if there could be any study to see the people that go into yoga who actually come out and do try to work for social change. I mean, because it seems like I'm thinking about Clay goes out and we're in a cave. The oh. person who goes out and becomes alive wants to come in and share with everybody else. Mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, if yoga is. Which makes you know, me think like of Kabatsen again. <laughs> he of sort of has this narrative. Yeah, the extension of if you're, you know, yeah, Kabatsen says, you know, you're going to, you know, there's going to be some compassion. Well, people do have real experiences of transformation through yoga, and they do want to share that. And so they write about it, and they become yoga teachers. Um, I, I mean, I, 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 I do think people are transformed. Um, I, I, I take them seriously when they say they are. Um, but then, but, the, but they're still, they're still sort of situated in neoliberal capitalism and um, articulating their transformation through neoliberal discourses and values. So, yeah, but if you're just not transformed, you really step outside the, the system. You mm -hmm. really want to make the change, right? I mean, do they? Yes, I'm wondering. Well, sure, they want to make a change, yeah. So, like, they want to, like, spread the good vibes. They, they, they genuinely want to. <laughs> But, you know, whether that'll, like, bring about a world in which we all are, like, happy and free, you know, they're, they're good you know it's, their good vibes are not effective in that sense. Can I jump in here? Because I'm, as someone who is really interested in, uh, you know, pre-modern uh, religions of South Asia, I'm hearing a lot of unexpected echoes just in this phase of the conversation of yoga's roots in an ideology of renunciation, small communities of asceticism, and a basic goal of total withdrawal from, or sorry, a goal of self-absorption, right, that's um, absorption in the self for purposes of liberation and the mechanism of withdrawal from society, right? So, so if we kind of look at yoga historically, it has never, might have inadvertently involved social change and catalyzed social change in certain contexts, right? But in some ways, maybe it's no surprise that we're getting a similar self-absorption just expressed in a neoliberal yeah. Framework here, right? That there's there's a form of asceticism that you're kind of talking about, even if it's a highly commodified. Oh, totally. And, I write uh, a lot about in, the, indulgent the, yeah. asceticism. Right? Yeah, no, I write a lot about the asceticism of consumer culture. Mm. Uh, it's absolutely deeply ascetic, and I get these anecdotes. One of them I recently included in the book. It's 
you know, I had a friend text me, I just got out of my first yoga class and pigeon, fuck pr- pigeon. It's like the antithesis of, of like peace and love. And he, he was, <laughs> I mean, he was tortured, right? right, right. And he, yeah, and then he was like, and I'm going back. And he absolutely <laughs> did, right? Um, and, and so, uh, no, there's, it's deeply ascetic. Uh, but I, it's also about purity, right? We get all of these discourses around purity. And, and you mentioned bringing together the sort of right-wing Hindutva stuff and the neoliberal spiritual, gang, spiritual gangster stuff. One of the things that unites these worlds is a, the discourses around purity. And for me, that's about um, creating in-groups and out-groups, right? And maintaining social hierarchies. Right? And so we could also say, well, this is, this is not just historically what yoga's been about, but this is what historically religion's been about, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, so that's why I like yoga too, though, is like it's this way of really talking about everything. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Please. I have a question about popular critiques of yoga. So, I mean, the one that I think is most kind of obvious is the cultural appropriation critique, which arguably I think also relies on a argument of purity. Also, of like Islamic aesthetic yoga practices, and a critique of that could be, oh, this is this is like Hindu influence. This is anti-Islamic. Mm-hmm. Which again, mm-hmm. relies on the purity critique. Mm-hmm. Do you find popular critiques that can move outside of kind of the yeah reliance on purity? So uh, one of the things I did in selling yoga, and I also do in this uh, current project, is I do talk about cultural appropriation, but I also try to nuance this critique because I see the um, critiques coming out of the sort of uh, the, the, the Indian side where, where South Asians are saying uh, we're uncomfortable with the commodification of yoga because we, we experience it as a violation of our cultural heritage, right? Um, I think that s- essentializes yoga in a way that echoes the essentialisms of consumers themselves who are like, ooh, yoga, it's ancient and Indian and and they, and they have really no notion of the yoga's actual history. It's just like ancient and that makes it cool or somehow authentic, right? And so I, I sort of resist all of these essentialisms um, and just say, we've got to just like bracket. And you see this in the meditation, work, the work on meditation too. Um, so um, selling spirituality, for example, I see this study as falling victim to essentialism, right? They're, they'll, they, they, they don't get um, the history of South Asian religions, and they don't care to actually engage experts on the history of South Asian religions, and so instead they make these like, ma- like vast generalizations about what yoga was before it was commodified, or what mindfulness was before it was commodified. And this drives me nuts. Um, and so I think that there are better and worse ways to engage in cultural appropriation. Um, and and uh, I'll, I know that's like not a popular thing to say that like that cultural appropriation isn't always equally bad in every way, or that sometimes it can be even okay. Um, but I do think that sometimes cultural appropriation can be okay. Um, so so I try to sort of you know offer a critique that reflects that that sort of anti-essentialist position. Uh-huh. Yeah, and I was thinking if you have um, compared how yoga practitioners, when they are engaged in this kind of activism, and how is that different from? Because there are many other people that are also doing this kind of activism. Like they don't want, or um, they don't see a way that that's actively encourage them to go out there and push for structural change. So they are also just doing this little things. I was wondering if. Um, since yoga has this healing um, function, do you feel like yoga practitioners, when they do these things, they are maybe just thinking more about like compassion and love instead of um, just maybe, maybe different from what other um, activism will include as an anger or um, just, I guess it's different kinds of um, attitudes that people will have if they do yoga and do this activism. Ah, 
So are you saying that, are you asking, is there a way, or are there, is there something unique about yoga? Is that what you're asking? As compared to like other forms of conscious capitalism? Um, I see these as interlinked in a phenomenon, like the, the conscious capitalism stuff and the neoliberal spirituality uh, discourses. I, I don't see them as different. I see all of them as ultimately upholding neoliberal capitalism, but in a way that allows people to express their discomfort with capitalism, right? So, uh, so in the same, like the, you know, this example of the Hollywood, the film that villainizes capitalism, I feel like the same thing is at play in both the conscious capitalism and neoliberal spirituality, where the consumption performs our sub subversion for us, right? So we buy from Whole Foods or we buy from, you know, uh, um, spiritual gangster or a company that's like giving a certain percentage of profits to feed the poor. Um, and that performs our subversion and our discomfort with capitalism for us. Then our activism is done. Uh, so that, does that answer your, your question? It's in, in and, I, and I think that um, there's, Probably some interesting work that could be done, and I haven't, I haven't uh, dived into this conversation, but with phil philanthropic studies, um, and of course, there's all sorts of work there on charitable giving, and sort of ethics of charity, charitable giving, um, and I think that 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 you know that could also be like another kind of critique, one that kind of engages with philanthropic studies um, to look at conscious capitalism and in, in specifically in terms of spirituality. That. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Do you feel like um, with yoga, um, people, when, when they do activism, are they kind of less antagonistic? Or are they less what? Le an antagonistic because it's more, more, more about everyone should be happy. Oh, yeah. I don't think so. I mean, I think uh, that, I, that yoga is oftentimes sold as a product that gives us, well, Yoga and mindfulness are sold as products to deal with stress, right? Um, I do think that they can alleviate stress. Uh, whether that makes people less antagonistic, though, I'm not sure. I think those are two different things. So I'd have to think about that, but I, I don't think so. All right, well, thank you, Andrea, so much. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for all your questions. I really appreciated them, and they got me thinking about a lot of things. So great, great. appreciate well, it. Well, we can continue this conversation in the hallway. We have some uh, refreshments uh, here. So, but, and thanks to everyone for coming and for making this a great discussion. Thank you. I was thinking um, that you you've heard really. Very close version. That's true, I probably did. So while I was up here reading yeah, it, I was thinking, oh, poor thing. No, 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 there were some new ones in there. Yeah, I, I do. I always, uh, every time I go to the talk, I yeah. rework. Yeah. Even if I'm giving it, you know, based on this book, right. I still try to rework it a little bit. But, um, yeah, yeah, I try to write it. Oh, thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks for coming and thanks for your questions. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks again. Hi. 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 Hi.